Hello, and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the life of the McStay family. In November 2009, Joseph and Summer McStay bought a home in Avocado Vista Lane. This was in Fulbrook in San Diego County, California. Joseph, who was 40 at the time, owned a company called Earth Inspired Products, which specialised in building decorative water features. His wife, Summer, was 43 years old and was looking to return to work as a real estate agent, having spent the previous few years being a stay-at-home mum to the couple's two children, Gianni, aged four, and Joe Jr., who was almost three years old. Joseph also had a 12-year-old son from a previous marriage called Jonah. Summer was born Virginia Lisa Aranda, but had been known by various different names throughout her life. She often used her stepfather's surname, Martelli. She had a somewhat quirky personality and had changed her given name to Summer, even trying to get her sister Tracy to change her name to Autumn. The family lived a comfortable life in a fairly typical suburban neighbourhood. They were in the process of renovating and modernising their home. On 31st of January 2010, the couple celebrated their youngest son, Joe Jr.'s third birthday. Everyday life was very normal. Work proceeded on their house, and in early February, Summer made plans to meet up with her sister a few days later to meet her sister's newborn baby for the first time. Joseph was busy at work and attending meetings. On the 4th of February 2010, Joseph called his business associate, Charles Merritt. It was around 8.30pm and Charles was watching a film. Knowing that their calls would often last quite a long time, Charles did not pick up and decided to speak to Joseph the following day. Over the next few days, family members and friends tried and failed to contact either Joseph or Summer. On February 10th, a business associate by the name of Daniel Kavanagh became concerned and contacted the San Diego Police Department. He hadn't heard from Joseph for almost a week, which was particularly unusual as they were generally in contact most days. The San Diego Sheriff went to check the family's home, but did not see any sign of a disturbance or anything which caused him to be concerned. Mike, Joe's brother, was also beginning to become increasingly concerned about the family's whereabouts. After repeated attempts to reach them by telephone, Mike decided to visit Joe and Summer's home on the 13th of February 2010. He was accompanied by Charles Merritt, who had also expressed concern about being unable to contact Joseph. Upon arrival at the house, Mike discovered that the family dogs, Bear and Digger, were in the back garden without any food or water. Mike saw that the study window was slightly open and climbed into the house. He saw that food had been left out in the kitchen, but the family were nowhere to be seen. Understandably concerned by what he had found, Mike contacted the local police who decided to investigate further. Initial investigation led to more questions than answers. The unfed animals and discarded food hinted to the family leaving in a hurry. There were no signs of a struggle or forced entry and it appeared that nothing of any value was missing from the house. The family had simply disappeared. Interviews with local residents provided a lead in the investigation. A neighbour's security camera showed a car leaving the McStay house nine days earlier on the evening of 4th of February 2010. The quality of the security footage was not particularly clear, however this was assumed to be the family's white Isuzu Trooper. The occupants of the car could not be seen due to the angle of the video footage. The police conducted interviews with the McStay's family, friends and business associates. Soon after, it was discovered that the family's car had been found abandoned several days earlier on the 8th of February 2010 in a car park in San Isidro in San Diego. This was close to the US-Mexico border. Forensic investigation of the family's computer uncovered several internet searches that had been completed in the weeks prior to their disappearance. 
Included in these were searches to find out the documentation required to enter Mexico and searches about learning Spanish. When video surveillance of the Mexican border crossing was reviewed, a dark image of a family of four fitting a description of the McStays walking across the border was recovered. The police announced that it was their belief that the family had upped and left, travelling to Mexico of their own free will. However, to those who knew the family, this simply made no sense whatsoever. Why would they quickly leave their home without taking any of their possessions? Why would they abandon their two dogs with no one to care for them? Why wouldn't they take their car with them into Mexico? And why had they not told anyone or withdrawn their savings to fund their trip? Their relatives refused to believe that the family had simply upped and left. As months turned into years, they were dedicated in keeping the disappearance in the public eye in the hope that they could locate Joseph, Summer, Gianni and Joe Jr. Details of the disappearance was included in the TV shows America's Most Wanted and Unsolved Mysteries, which resulted in more leads, but these ultimately led to more dead ends. Their relentless search for their family members came at a huge personal cost. The publicity at times turned negative towards the family, with many amateur detectives jumping to their own incorrect and incredibly hurtful conclusions. On 11th of November 2013, almost four years after the disappearance, the news that the family members had been dreading arrived. A motorcyclist had discovered the remains of the McStay family in shallow graves outside the town of Victorville in California. Identification was made through dental records and the cause of death was established as blunt force trauma to the head. A three-pound sledgehammer that was found with the bodies was assumed to be the murder weapon. The sledgehammer and bodies had traces of paint from the family's home on it. The missing person investigation was now a murder case. Suspicion started to fall upon the man who had accompanied Mike to the house to look for the family years earlier, Joe's business associate, Charles Merritt. Upon investigation, it was found that Charles had a criminal record Despite his convictions being over 10 years old and all being for non-violent crimes, the fact that Charles had been convicted for burglary and possession of stolen property led the police to dig into his life further. Charles had worked with Joe on several construction projects over the years and the pair seemed to get on really well. On the afternoon of the disappearance, 4th of February 2010, Charles had met with Joe at a local fast food restaurant where, according to Charles, they sorted payment for some previous jobs and also discussed some future contracts. Charles was the last person to see Joe alive. The police discovered that Charles had a gambling problem, often spending days at a time in local casinos where he was known to lose large sums of money, far more than his contractor's income would support. Charles had fraudulently written cheques totaling over $21,000 from Joe's business bank account to pay off some of his gambling debts. He had also withdrawn further money at the time of and after the family had gone missing. Evidence was found that showed Charles had impersonated Joseph in an attempt to delete evidence of these cheques. When interviewed, Charles stated that he had never driven the McStay's family car and yet his DNA was found on both the steering wheel and gear stick. Investigators were also able to pinpoint that Charles's cell phone had been in the area of the desert grave sites in the days after the family's disappearance. It was also noted that in the interviews immediately following the family's disappearance, Charles had continuously referred to the family in the past tense. When questioned about this, he could provide no explanation as to why. On Wednesday, November the 5th, 2014, Charles was arrested and charged with four counts of murder. After being repeatedly delayed due to Charles changing his legal representation, the trial finally got underway on the 7th of January, 2019, in San Bernardino, California. Charles pleaded not guilty to all charges. The prosecution showed that Charles had been stealing money from Joseph's company and suggested that when Joseph had found out about this and confronted him, 
Charles had murdered Joseph and his family. The defence claimed that there was no physical evidence that linked Charles to the murders. They attempted to point the finger at Joseph's other business associate, Daniel Kavanagh, who they claimed police completely overlooked during the investigation of the crime. After five months, on 10th of June 2019, Charles was found guilty on four counts of murder. He was sentenced to death on the 21st of January 2020. It is however unlikely that this sentence will ever be carried out due to a moratorium on the death penalty within the state. Charles is currently on death row in San Quentin prison. He still claims that he is innocent and plans to appeal his sentence. Relatives of the McStay family have waited over 10 years to see the person responsible for Joseph, Summer, Gianni and Joe Jr's murders to be brought to justice. They now face the added ordeal of this man appealing his sentence. That concludes today's story. Please add any comments down below. And now it's time for Petty Crime. Over to you Luke. Hi everyone, it's Luke here, narrator for Unsolvable. Crimey has very kindly invited me to be part of his petty criminal feature in today's video. Today's petty criminal is Lila. She's a very special dog because she's mine. My girlfriend Daniela and I rescued Lila from Cyprus almost four years ago and she has been living her best life here in London with us ever since. Lila is a notorious sock thief and she has been caught on several occasions raiding the laundry basket in search of both fresh and dirty socks. On her few successful attempts, we have discovered them buried amongst her toys. Although she has the worst poker face, I can always tell what she's been up to. Anyway, back to you Crimey. Thanks so much for that Luke. Sock thief Leela is absolutely beautiful. For those of you interested in Unsolvable's channel, there will be a link in the description and you may well see a comment from Luke. Well worth a look. Very, very interesting. Next up we have Lucy, who has kindly sent in pictures of her two beauties. Lucy is from Newcastle, Australia. That will have tricked some of our listeners from England. The first cat is Luna, who is a notorious pen thief. This doesn't help owner Lucy, especially when she's studying. The other partner in crime is Shadow, whose specialist skill is opening cupboards and also runs around always trying to pick on Luna. All normality is restored though, thanks to the current cold weather they're experiencing, as they like to sleep under the bedsheets and everyone is calm. Thanks for sending the pictures in, Lucy. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. I'd like to express my gratitude to Audrey Gibson from Hartsville, South Carolina, and Preska from BC. They have collated all the petty criminal information to date. I will be uploading this to the community board in due course. It's not going as easy as I would have liked, but I will work it out eventually. And just before I go, did you see that Leela had an Instagram? It was in the bottom right corner of the video. It's at Leela for Cyprus. And you may remember Jeffrey, the well-traveled cat from a few weeks ago. He, of course, has an Instagram account as well. And that's biker underscore ducky. Goodbye.